Well, he was part right with the Babe Ruth uh, reference. I am an old guy, a really old guy, it seems like. But anyway, uh, so, uh, th- yeah, it's a pleasure. I've known Jennifer uh, probably for 25 or more years now. Uh, back in uh, the old days when I was still at home on the ranch, I was on the Nebraska Beef Council and involved with, uh, I was actually on the, uh, executive committee of the National Livestock and Meat Board at one time uh, before it uh, merged with um, uh, cattlemen to become NCBA, NCA to become NCBA. And so uh, I knew Jennifer back in those days and we worked together on issues there. And so I'm uh, sure that uh, she's excited about the year ahead, getting prepared to be president, and uh, I'm sure she'll do a great job. And uh, as far as traceability goes, she's kind of in a unique situation, is that she represents uh, with her own business one of the segments that uh, I think is challenged with understanding exactly how uh, they work and interface with animal traceability on uh, you know a speed of commerce time frame. And so I think it's, uh, she'll provide some great insight and leadership uh, to the beef industry to help them uh, work together with all segments to be able to move forward. You know, I, uh, maybe just a little bit, I think a lot of you know my background, but I still uh, kind of uh, consider myself a rancher from uh, central Nebraska, even though I've kind of had to step away from, or I've had to step away from day-to-day management and marketing. I still uh, enjoy very much uh, when I can steal a little bit of time to get back to the ranch or uh, uh, more so when I have the opportunity to talk to uh, my son who uh, came back to the ranch this summer because he wasn't sure that the workload that I'd left on his mother was quite fair. So he went home to help work with the foreman and the other two guys and help his mom understand uh, ranch accounts and stuff, and, um, and we're excited to have him home. We have triplets, and so Alec is one of those. Uh, and Evan works uh, in agriculture as well. He works in Minneapolis, he works for the Schooler Company, a uh, grain trading company that's based out of Omaha, Nebraska. And then our daughter Emily lives in Denver, Colorado, and is a lobbyist for the Colorado Farm Bureau. So we're happy to have all of our children still paying attention to agriculture, still involved in agriculture, and uh, look forward to uh, their future in agriculture as well. You know, as a director of ag for 12 years and six years as assistant director before that, I uh, had the great opportunity to kind of become uh, versed in the programs that uh, as a customer, as a state director of ag, you're really a customer of APHIS and AMS because a lot of the programs that I have in MRP are what relate directly to those state departments of agriculture across our nation. And so I got to uh, learn about uh, those programs as a customer, and now I'm uh, the uh, service deliverer. And so I come with uh, some preconceived notions as to uh, you know, how that relationship works, how we might can make it work better. And I also understand uh, when uh, some uh, state uh, uh, director, commissioner, secretary is telling me it doesn't work this way, I also understand whether really might work that way if they just wanted to make it work that way. And so I'm excited about the opportunity to work together uh, with uh, state partners, with industry, because those are really my roots. Uh, The industry first and then the State Department of Agriculture to be able to come to USDA to work together. You know, as we've uh, approached the farm, I'm going to talk about a few different things other than what I'm going to talk about tomorrow just so that there's still a reason for me to be able to get free breakfast out of Sunday in the morning. Uh, But, you know, as we've worked on the Farm Bill, there's been a lot of discussion in the Farm Bill about uh, disease traceability and disease management, and most of that has focused on foot and mouth disease. And, you know, what, what would we do in the event that foot and mouth disease shows up here in the United States? And uh, we at USDA have talked about a three-legged stool with surveillance and, uh, and prevention and being prepared and being able to c- 
control, to contain, and eradicate as being one of those important legs that uh, really that leg is the leg that has let us go nearly over 70 years and uh, working close to 100 years without, uh, not quite 100 yet, but well over 70 without having foot and mouth here in the United States. Uh, but as we look now at what's going on around the world, you know, while we were worried about foot and mouth disease, African swine fever has really erupted and become something that, while the beef industry doesn't necessarily need to worry about it, it's something that's very scary to the pork industry. So it shows that uh, we can't just focus on one disease. There's many diseases out there in the world that are scary and that could have uh, a, a huge economic impact on our livestock industry. But it also shows how important when we look at how China's epidemic has grown and grown uh, with their with parts of their uh, growth of that disease that they've been willing to acknowledge that they, it just keeps, the circle keeps getting bigger, there's more circles that keep expanding and overlapping, that the ability to identify a disease, know where it came from, where it was going, and then being able to try to attack it and control and contain it is very important. And a sport, of course, traceability plays a big role in that and probably uh, the very uh, foundation of that concern. The other part of that is a, a, a lab system that is able to diagnose and uh, be close to where the producers are, be close to where the species that we're needing to make diagnosis uh, are from and have being close to state departments of agriculture make producers more, or state universities make producers more willing to interact with that. And then finally, you know, if there are vaccines available out there, uh, vaccines are an important tool that we would use in most uh, animal disease outbreaks to try to manage them. African swine fever doesn't have a vaccine available, so that's, that wouldn't be a tool that's in our toolbox there, but it's something uh, we're working on. As we look forward, though, to you know, managing for today and what could, might be available on the forefront, biotechnology is something that falls within APHIS's realm on the plant side very firmly, but as we see opportunities for disease resistance and humane animal care and management uh, to be part of uh, uh, the future in animal biotechnology, I think it's very important that all of our industries uh, work together to try to embrace what biotechnology could mean for us. If we can uh, uh, quit dehorning cattle because we can introduce the genes very efficiently without losing, especially in the dairy herd, without losing milk production uh, by using biotechnology, what a great uh, leap forward. If we can eliminate the costs that PERS uh, places on our swine industry through biotechnology without losing feed efficiency and meat production ability. Uh, what a, a great opportunity. And as you know, that's one of the sources of debate in uh, D.C. right now is who's going to manage uh, biotechnology and who's going to figure out the regulatory uh, framework to be able to allow us to embrace and utilize that. And that's something that's very important that uh, we get through, and we're going to have a, a summit together with, uh, uh, with FDA on, on uh, several subjects, but uh, biotechnology is also one thing that we're, we're discussing with FDA right now. But while we're discussing how we move forward, those technologies have been advanced, uh, perfected, and are ready for commercialization. And what we see is the research that's been done in the United States is now moving to Canada and South America to be commercialized. And that means that there's jobs being developed in the countries uh, just to the north of us and in our competing, uh, competing uh, countries worldwide that is going away from the United States. There's investment that's going away from the United States and maybe more important than either one of those two is the fact that they're gaining a competitive advantage on us because they're able to use that uh, technology. So this is something we need to get uh, figured out and we need to get figured out soon so that 
uh, the U.S. producing livestock producers are able to take uh, advantage of that. And that's something that uh, when the president was, uh, um, when the secretary was first uh, sworn in, the president uh, picked uh, the secretary to lead a task force on rural prosperity. And uh, 22 different federal agencies worked together to figure out how we develop the rural economy under Secretary Perdue's leadership. And they came out with five main points, but one of them was harne harnessing technological innovation. And so that's something that uh, uh, 22 different agencies identified as an important point and that we, we understand looking at the opportunities that we're delaying being able to take advantage of, that that's something that's very important that we need to, uh, to get right as we move forward. Uh, part of that is also developing the rural economy and not by trying to bring outside forces into rural America, but it's by looking at rural America and saying, what are people in communities across our United States capable of doing? What culturally are they excellent at doing? What fits the natural resources of their region? And in many of the states across our nation, livestock agriculture is one of those answers. We grow the feedstuffs uh, for the uh, uh, feed for those animals. We have uh, strong heritages in livestock production across agriculture in rural areas of America. And that presents a great opportunity for us to be able to play to our strengths, to be able to not only produce uh, food for our domestic uh, population, but also look around the world. We're going to figure out these trade uh, difficulties we're working through right now. We're going to end up with uh, agreements that allow for us to be able to move animals and meat products around based on science and, ba and based on, on uh, fair, tra fair trade, not just free trade. And so uh, once we figure that out, we've all, look what uh, the American farmer and rancher have already been able to compete very well with unfair trade rules. If we have a level playing field, I can only imagine the success that rural America will have in the international marketplace when we don't have to compete against a double standard. And so uh, I think maybe uh, just to uh, quickly summarize, and then I guess I've been volunteered to take questions, and any ones I can't answer, Glenn will help me out with. And <laughs> but, uh, you know, uh, we ha I mentioned that we had triplets. And so as when you have triplets, and we were very involved in, we were in a small community, the kids' this high school class was 22. We were involved in 4-H and FFA. And when you have triplets, you, you know, everybody's in the show ring at the same time. Everybody uh, is uh, working on a uh, proficiency every, at the same time. Everybody's in the same class officer election pyramid. So you learn very quickly that uh, not everybody can be number one, not everybody can be valedictorian, not everybody uh, can be president of the FFA chapter, not everybody can be champion at the county fair. The, not, and we weren't always champion at the county fair. There were some other kids that got that, uh, got that opportunity quite a few times as well. But we developed a philosophy at home that when one of us won, we all won. And that was something that we started out from the time they were small, that we were all in this together as a family. And I think that's something that's very true for agriculture, too. Although we have differences within our sectors as, as, as well as within regions of the United States, uh, in agriculture, we are such a small population compared to uh, many of the other interest groups are out there and around us that we have to remember when one of us wins, we all win. And we need to figure out how to work together to make sure that uh, somebody can win so that we all can win. So thank you very much. Any questions? As far as the energy, the conversation, has anything shifted? Are we going to have around 
around traceability, around trade, around biotechnology, <laughs> traceability. So I think that uh, the farm bill was very, that, that discussion about animal disease and what a, uh, a foreign animal disease would mean to uh, the economic viability of the livestock industry was helpful. I also think that it gave uh, producers, especially in the beef industry, a chance to finally point to something and understand something that actually was of value to them. Because in a lot of ways, the conversations we'd been having about traceability in the beef industry, uh, as a cow-calf producer, lots of, uh, cow, like I am myself, lots of cow-calf producers had trouble figuring out how that benefited them because they didn't necessarily get carcass data back from the packer. They didn't necessarily, uh, you know, get their uh, feed efficiency or rate of gain information back from the feedlot. And so uh, it was hard for lots of producers to understand what that, what the value was to them. But when you start talking about a disease that might could come and wipe out your entire herd or a forced depopulation of your entire herd, I think that was a different realization. And so we need to continue to uh, work together to help all segments of the beef industry understand what, what the value to them is and how they can participate in it. And I think some of the things we're talking about uh, with the traceability working group, as well as what we're going to be able to announce and work with um, the beef industry uh, into the future, are going to provide uh, not only incentives, but opportunities for value for them. And I know that that has been a, a concern for a long time. And I, see, I, I have uh, more faith in the philosophy that if you have uh, good management practices put in place, if you document what you do, so if you're participating in a traceability scheme, you're probably uh, working with a, a group or an organization to document uh, what practices you put in place on your farm and ranch. And so I have a lot of faith in that being the way that you uh, protect yourself from claims that you used antibiotics wrong or you use feed ingredients that were prohibited or some of those concerns that uh, are a uh, cow-calf uh, operation, th th they've voiced those concerns in the past. You know, well, how do I know it didn't happen at the feedlot? But if you have uh, those practices in place, you're participating in a traceability scheme that, uh, you know, have somebody come in and audit the practices to say what you say you're doing, you're actually doing, I have faith in that, in that process. So we're, uh, I think the hearing that we have coming up with FDA um, has uh, more to do with the cellular meat or the uh, fake meat or clean meat or whatever camp you're in. And so that not, isn't necessarily biotechnology, but it is advancements in what we're able to do uh, with cellular technology now. And so that is the, the discussion that's coming up here in October, I believe. So there's uh, two different opportunities for that decision to be made, or maybe three actually. You know, one, the two organizations, two uh, agencies could, could get together and, and, and make a decision on and how we can move forward with that. The other opportunity is uh, uh, for the administration to, to pick an agency to try to centralize that in. And the president actually has a plan in his uh, government uh, uh, consolidation plan that he released earlier this year 
that USDA would be in charge of, a, uh, of the singular food safety agency within the federal government. So a lot of people when that came out thought that that probably uh, wasn't, uh, you know, there were a lot of different uh, things in that uh, proposal that affected everything from immigration to, to food safety. But so the, the, the administration does have a little bit of an idea and a, a stake in the ground that a single food safety agency wouldn't be a bad idea and they have designated that that would be USDA but uh, that might take an executive order or something, and you know that could change with the next uh, administration as we've seen with executive orders. And so the third option would be that Congress makes a decision, and there are some discussions going, home, going on on Capitol Hill right now that Congress can make a decision. And so you know, um, those are all discussions that are going on. I'm sure Congress is listening to groups and organizations uh, across the United States for maybe even what you as individuals are interested in having happen there. Well, obviously, we saw when we worked to open up China that traceability still is a big deal to a, a large potential market like that. And lots of other uh, countries have an interest in uh, you know, what's your traceability, what's your disease status. How do you know that's your disease status if you don't have traceability and some of those questions. But I think uh, also consumers have shown more and more that they're interested in uh, the story about where their food came from. They want to know there's traceability within that food system. You know, when I was a kid, mom and dad, uh, we went, all went to the grocery store together usually, and you know, mom had the sale circular and she bought based on what was on sale. And we bought whatever was on sale that day and then the next week or two weeks later when we were there, we bought what was on sale there. and. She stockpiled lots of stuff, but we bought based on price. And that's really the only consideration that uh, we made at the grocery store was price. There's very few things we bought because uh, uh, we, we like that brand. And so, uh, but that's different now. Uh, the consumer goes to the grocery store and you, you uh, the sales circular at our house gets thrown away with the rest of the newspaper unopened because nobody had time to read it at home. And, or if they were at home, they didn't have time to, uh, right now nobody's at home a lot of the time. But um, it, so people buy on brands, they buy on reputation, they buy on what the meat case says about the product there. And so that story and that traceability becomes very important. And so I think that, that uh, that's another reason why traceability uh, can be valued by producers and producers are going to be able to see a, a value in it. I think the other reason why I think we have a better opportunity uh, to make traceability work is because we've all learned a lot from the last 14 or 15 years of talking about this. And uh, we've learned that certain discussions uh, didn't get us down the road. And uh, I think we at USDA are now ready to embrace putting together some of the basics and the the cornerstones and having the basic frameworks uh, put in place to be able to allow the data to move back and forth, to be in a position to be able to start moving forward uh, with, if we need to uh, give the industry a gentle nudge here and there, that we're going to be ready to do that. I don't mean to leave out pork and poultry in some of these comments, but they're so much farther down the road than the beef industry. It's hard to talk about what they need to do to catch up or where they need, uh, what, what goals they need to do because we're really focused on being able to help the beef industry um, uh, bring some uh, uh, catch up to where pork and poultry are. We also need to look uh, forward to some of the uh, ways that we can move data electronically. Uh, and electronic health certificates, I think, are an important part of that. As director of ag, it wouldn't be strange at all 
Uh, we're a big livestock feeding state in Nebraska, and so it wouldn't be strange at all that we would get health certificates three or four months down the road from when the cattle had actually arrived in the feedlot. They might be at the packing plant before uh, somebody found the health certificate laying on the dash, tore it out, and started sending it through the system. And so we know that isn't going to help us out if we need to trace animals in a foreign animal disease outbreak. So we, uh, we have uh, some very key roles to play at USDA as well. Pardon? Aren't you? <laughs> so, well, uh, you know, I look forward to visiting with you again in the morning. Oh. Well, so those might be two different uh, answers to two different, very different questions. Uh, but you know, ultimately, it's it's the producers, and it's not necessarily the the uh, you know the uh, guy that has the the farrowing operation and produces the feeder pigs. It's not necessarily the cow calf guy. It's every segment of the industry has a lot of in investment in their own segment of that industry. And if a serious animal disease uh, uh, breaks out in the U.S., um, they, they, they stand a lot to lose. So everybody has that to gain. But even if we look at some of the uh, diseases that we've had here in the United States uh, for a period of time, uh, tuberculosis, uh, especially in cattle right now, uh, you know, we're we're supposed, after working all these years on it, we we should be almost eliminating tuberculosis, and we're actually maybe seeing a little bit of a, an upspring of more cases and a concentration uh, in in a few states around the nation, and so traceability has a big role to play there because states that receive feeder cattle. Uh, from the states uh, where there's a trace out from, spend a lot of time and money trying to find that that animal. And so there's resources of time and, and effort being wasted there. And, you know, who pays for it? You know, I think that you know, we're going to work together to figure that out. I think states and the federal government have a role to play together there. But also, if you don't have skin in the game yourself. If you have, as a producer, if you haven't put some investment into the system more than just your labor to apply the technology, you're not necessarily going to be as interested in getting back data or figuring out what that traceability can tell you. So I think that everybody, all segments need to have uh, skin in the game. They need to have investment in the game to be able to really see what's of value to them. Think of your own life and uh, other experiences you've had in other places in your life. If it's just given to you, you take it for granted. Look at your kids or grandkids. If it's just given to them, they tend to take it for granted. They don't value it the same way as if they actually have to earn it themselves. And so I think that that's, uh, that's part of the philosophy we need to incorporate here as well. <laughs> 